Hello. Our story begins inside Yoda's meditation chamber in the Jedi Temple. Anakin and Yoda sat across from each other on their chairs, talking about what Anakin was experiencing through his dreams. The visions he referred to were about pain, death, and suffering. Yoda in this moment used what 900 years of life had taught him, letting go. There was an obvious disconnect that happened with Yoda and every new generation of Jedi born. As he continued to age, the galaxy continued to form around the Jedi. Yoda was always able to get through to each generation because, like him, they were trained and taught to be Jedi from birth. Anakin, on the other hand, was an outlier to that whole system. And because he was an outlier, it meant that Yoda had to work extra diligently to get through to him. Yoda, along with the rest of the council, wanted Anakin to succeed. However, the collective minds of the council had been pushed far from the path of the Jedi. It was a collective allegiance to the Republic that in of itself barely stood anymore. The Jedi had become intertwined with political interests, and their focus and ability to feel through the Force had deteriorated. Yoda was a cataclysm of this, but despite his greatest failures, he still wanted to help Anakin. He was reaching out, and Yoda wanted to take advantage of this moment to show Anakin that he was one of them. Though his words and phrasings weren't what Anakin wanted to hear. That was something beyond Yoda's control though. He couldn't decide what it is that Anakin wanted to be told. He could tell Anakin what 900 years worth of life told him. As a young child, Yoda watched his first instructors die, and he had to adjust to that. He was 50 years old when his first instructor died, which in Anakin's age range would have meant he was 5 years old. It got harder from there too, because by the time Yoda was reaching his first 100 years of age, he had lost most of his instructors, aside from those who weren't variations of humans. But as a Jedi, he needed to learn that death is a natural part of life. As a sentient, he understood that attachments would form naturally, but as a Jedi, it was their duty to uphold the code and understand that attachments could bring about weaknesses. They could force one to pull away from the Force and the code itself. As a Jedi, they had powers unlike any other, and if they were to use said powers to change the fate of an individual, then they'd be playing a game that was not in harmony with the Force itself. Perhaps it was a flaw with the Order, or perhaps it was their dedication to maintaining the balance as the light is the will of the Force. No matter, Yoda had to adapt by the time he was 10 years old in Anakin's lifespan. Over the years, the task of watching others transcend into the living Force became constant in his life. Whether he was a Jedi Knight, Jedi Master, or Grandmaster of the Jedi Order, he was burdened with the life of watching people he cared for grow up and die before his eyes. The most difficult example of this being his first student, a girl he trained to become a Jedi Knight who eventually joined him on the High Council and passed away before he ever reached the age of 200. How does an instructor let go of a student they trained from such a young age? The bond created was immeasurable compared to any other Jedi could have. Yoda at that point in his life knew it would come. However, when the time came that she take her final breath, he was unprepared. To show Anakin that would be difficult, Yoda was trying to help in a way that only a Jedi could, except the reality of a situation. The Force was always in motion and the death of those close to Anakin were never guaranteed in the moment presented during the vision. However, death was a natural part of life, and as Yoda suggested, don't be sad, rejoice in those having passed on to the living Force. It was a realm where one, no matter who they may be, finds true unity with the Force. All living beings are connected to the Force, and while Yoda assumed Anakin was worried about Ahsoka or Obi-Wan, the same would be true for anyone else, for they would too become one with the Force. Anakin was displeased with the direction of the conversation. He knew there were things about the Force the Jedi weren't teaching him. It led to Anakin becoming distant, and Yoda noticed this. Skywalker was hoping he could come to Yoda and he could teach him some magical powers on the Force that would aid him in saving someone's life. But this was Anakin forgetting the nature of the Force. It wasn't about becoming powerful, it was about finding harmony, uniting with the balance that existed within every living being. Anakin was hopeful that this endeavor would result in Yoda bestowing him the keys to the restricted section so that he could run rampant and save Padme like the savior he was, but that wasn't the path of a Jedi. As was said to him on Mortis, he and Padme were never destined to be together. Anakin's destiny was always to find balance in the Force, but his own motives pulled him away from that. The father wished that he could have chosen the path of a chosen one, the one that a chosen one should be able to make, one of sacrifice and resistance to the darkness. Skywalker at that moment was incapable of it. He had the chance to do it once again, and he denied what the Force itself requested of him. Yoda looked on in disappointment as Anakin looked prepared to leave the room in a rush. Always on the move was young Skywalker. Yoda didn't like the idea of messing with the Force, but in a moment so pivotal, and his lack of trust for Anakin, he decided that he would do something else. But it wasn't something he would tell Anakin about, so instead, he just watched Anakin get up and bow before leaving. That was that. Skywalker was always looking to the horizon. Yoda was supposed to go to Kashyyyk, because the Jedi couldn't forget about the joint attack on the Wookiees. 
Instead of offering himself up, Yoda suggested that Master Fisto accompany the clones to reinforce the Wookiees on Kashyyyk. The Jedi Master wasn't opposed to this, and he quickly agreed to the task set forward by the Grand Master. There were some other pleasantries during the conversation, but after the council session ended, Yoda went straight to the restricted section so he could pull up some old information he hadn't read about in a long while. There was a lot of information he could access in the restricted section. Some of these powers, well, most of them belonged to other eras, abilities most Jedi no longer used. To be a Jedi, one mustn't lose themselves in a quest for greater power. Yoda ran through his old teacher's instructions as he went through the restricted section. Would this be wrong of him to do? Perhaps it was ethically, but he couldn't allow those dreams to push Anakin down the wrong path. Yoda had visions of the future a multitude of times, and Yoda was under the belief that the vision he had of him and Anakin fighting Darth Sidious and Count Dooku would come true. However, with Dooku dead during the Battle of Coruscant, it reinforced his own position on the matter. Despite Anakin killing Dooku in his vision, always in motion is a force. The death of Dooku didn't accompany the death of the Sith Lord himself. That must come later. Yoda knew that if the Council was trusting of Anakin to be around Palpatine, then maybe he needed to change the playing field. If Palpatine was indeed the Sith, and he was altering Anakin's dreams, then Anakin was in a disadvantageous position, one that couldn't be allowed to take over him. Yoda searched through the archives for not more than an hour before he pulled out the information he believed would be beneficial for this task. He read through it once more just to make sure he didn't do anything that would negatively impact Skywalker. As the night came around, Yoda went to the temple's botanical garden, which was on the interior of the temple. He felt that the Tree of Life may be a tad bit extreme for him to connect in its moment. If there was too much resistance, then he would change the strategy. Yoda began simply by lighting some candles around himself, obviously not closer to plants in the garden, but just so he could channel through the burning light. He then connected himself across the planet. For some reason, why was Anakin not in the temple? Anyways, he continued and felt into his mind. He could see the dreams taking place. They were strenuous, but something felt awry. Yoda couldn't figure out why that was the case. The distance from Skywalker in the moment made everything feel weird to him. These dreams didn't come from the Force itself. They came from someone else close to Skywalker who had negative intentions for him. Yoda couldn't allow these dreams to plague him, so he altered them for the sake of saving the negativity. The vision had Padme dying in childbirth. To Yoda, he couldn't see who it was. He could just hear infants crying in Obi-Wan's voice, which was a little disordered so he couldn't hear what he was actually saying. The words weren't audible, but he knew the voice. For Anakin, all the terror continued until everything that was going wrong changed into something going right. It was confusing for Anakin, but he was able to enjoy the rest of the dream. But Yoda wasn't at all thrilled with the outcome of the situation. When he finished the meditation, the candles had died out, and the botanical gardens were silent and dark. The Force was out of balance, and the instrument of such change was actively trying to change the fate of Anakin Skywalker. Yoda was restless over this idea, because while there were reasons for Anakin to distrust the Council, there weren't any reasons for him to hate them. However, if the Dark Lord of the Sith made it seem like they didn't care about him, then that would be problematic. There was obviously a lack of trust going both ways. The Council put Anakin up to a task that would reward him highly if he succeeded, but they had to trust him. They were doing that. Anakin, on the other hand, just adopted a victim complex, just assuming that the Council was out to get him because he didn't get the rank of Master automatically. One doesn't achieve the rank of Master without having earned it through one of two methods. Ahsoka chose to not become a Jedi Knight, which was out of his control. He could train another student, or he could prove himself through a test, one that required him gaining the trust of the Collective Council. That was this. The Council never wanted to punish him for being himself, but they needed to trust him. Anakin's mission with the Chancellor was their way of doing that. Now to Yoda, everything felt like a setup. The Dark Lord of the Sith was ahead of them, and now he was working through Skywalker. Yoda, instead of going to sleep, summoned the Collective Council to the chambers and requested that they begin immediate discussions. He explained everything to them, and suggested his theories on the nightmares that Anakin was having. Mace noted that there may have been a disconnect between Yoda and young Skywalker during their interaction. He didn't trust Anakin, but recognized patterns, and he believed that given the circumstances of what Yoda was suggesting of their talk, Anakin had likely believed that Yoda wasn't attempting to help. It truthfully annoyed Mace, because he, just as every Jedi in the chambers understood, that Yoda was helping. He gave sound advice with handling grief and loss. But Mace also understood that Yoda was likely having a disconnect from Anakin because Anakin wouldn't just accept the status quo, whether or not it was an accurate one at that. Yoda realized that Mace was indeed telling the truth about the entire thing, and he apologized for his lack of clarity on the matter. There wasn't a need to apologize, though the Council needed to act quickly. So what were they to do? Should they stop the investigation on Palpatine? Could they trust Skywalker to not fall to the dark side? 
Should they continue to alter Anakin's dreams from a distance and hope that he makes the right decision? The choice became more difficult as the night continued on. It was a late night discussion too. Obi-Wan believed that maybe they should make him aware of the nightmares and how they were coming from an external source. Windu believed that would be counterproductive. Anakin wasn't always the brightest, but he was smart enough to deduce that the Jedi knowing that information meant that they were probing around in his mind. That was true. The Jedi couldn't risk the potential of Skywalker blaming them for going into his mind. Perhaps the best motive forward was continuing changing the dreams in secrecy. Yoda suggested to the council that he would request Skywalker back to his chambers so they could discuss more. If Anakin reacted positively to the change in his dreams, then perhaps that's all the council and Coruscant should focus on. Conversely, Yoda requested that while the Jedi were doing this, that a couple members from the council go to the restricted section and pull as much information as possible about the concept of revealing entities from Force visions. If Anakin handled the change of the visions well, Yoda was going to have the council reach back out through his mind during the next rest so they could find whoever was behind these dreams. The council adjourned and returned to the separate chambers for rest. In the morning, Yoda requested that Skywalker meet with him near the Tree of Life, having changed his mind on the idea of meeting Anakin inside of his chambers. Perhaps sunlight and being near the tree would be the best thing the two of them could do. When Anakin finally got to him, he felt lighter through the force. The weight that was on his back had seemingly lifted and he walked over to Yoda and spoke first, insisting that he gave some thought to what was said yesterday. This wasn't exactly true, but Anakin was able to come to terms with it, considering his dreams had been altered. Anakin then asked the Grey Master why he was brought out here, and Yoda just smiled, looking towards the tree that breathed gently in the wind. He told Skywalker that he just wanted to make sure he was handling everything alright. Anakin looked down and suggested that it wasn't the easiest thing in the galaxy, but he was handling it better now. Yoda asked him if there was anything on his mind that he'd like to share with him, and Anakin shook his head. There was an awkward silence for the two of them. Yoda seemed to have the old people fog in his mind as he was just staring at the tree silently. Anakin didn't want to be rude, but he also didn't know what to do now. Yoda asked Anakin if he'd ever heard the story of how he became a Jedi Knight. Anakin looked down and shook his head. Yoda told Anakin, just as Professor Hiang would start all of his stories, that it started a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Anakin and Yoda would be out in the temple garden for a little over an hour, before they split off again. The story was one of trial, uncertainty, and triumph. However, one does not simply become triumphant as a victor as a Jedi. One succeeds in their mandate to the Order, to the Code, and most importantly to the Force. The importance of this story for Anakin was to show him what it meant to be a Jedi, and his hopes were that Skywalker would take it to heart and go with it. Yoda knew that if the Dark Lord of the Sith was indeed behind this, then the High Council needed to be diligent. While Anakin was doing well in the moment, the Sith Lord would look to pull Anakin further from the light, and if he could achieve that, then he would take every opportunity to lock in on Skywalker. So to counter that, Yoda requested that each member of the Council take turns on keeping an eye on Anakin, obviously metaphorically through the Force. The council was full of wise and powerful individuals, and while Stas Ali, Plo Koon, Kit Fista, Depa Balaba, and Kiadamundi were off-world, it was important to have the other present Jedi focus on the task at hand. Though, the list would be expanded when Obi-Wan was dispatched to Utapau to intercept General Grievous, considering that after Yoda's story time with Anakin, the council gathered up and Anakin informed them that the Chancellor found out where General Grievous was. It was an odd turn of events, but with Fisto on Kashyyyk, Obi-Wan was the most fit Jedi Master to handle the situation. He and Grievous had a long-standing rivalry throughout the duration of the Clone Wars, and it would be their time to figure out who would reign champion over the other. The Clone Wars were on the line and the battle was set for the two good generals. On Coruscant, Anakin was struggling, but because of the Jedi, he was holding strong. At one point or another, after Obi-Wan left, Mace was watching over Anakin through the Force. By watching over, it was more or less the Jedi Master was in the Botanical Garden, the Garden with the Tree of Life, a meditation chamber, or somewhere highly attuned to the light. The individual would enter a meditation and focus their energy outwards towards Anakin's essence. They were all familiar with it, and because it was so vibrant and large, they locked onto it relatively easily and connected. The object for the Jedi was to let him have free will. Their only goal was to thwart any attempt to pull him away from the light. So the Jedi wouldn't be in his mind searching for his memories or secrets, not that they could do that easily to begin with. They were simply acting as unfelt and unseen guardians. They were in alignment with the Force, and so while Mace was peacefully meditating again, he could feel a vision begin to manifest. Anakin himself was staring at a tablet, but the vision came from another source. Skywalker was none the wiser because he assumed it was the Force itself, and he had every reason to believe it was. When he felt the call, he was pulled into the vision, but Mace acted quickly to force the darkness from Anakin's mind. The Dark Lord of the Sith was getting more and more antsy, but because of the nature of the Force, he couldn't pinpoint why the visions were getting pushed away. 
He knew Anakin was receiving them, but he had no clue that they were being changed by the Jedi. So for Sidious, he believed that Anakin's mind was such a steel trap that he was breaking through his barriers just without trying, planting the visions and then Skywalker pushing him out. He had no inclination to believe the Jedi would be the ones behind it, because Anakin had shown such disenchantment for the Jedi in the past couple days. When Palpatine told Anakin that the Jedi didn't trust him and the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise, he could tell that Anakin wasn't pulling away from him, and pulling away from the Jedi inversely. So to Sidious, he figured it was time to move to the next step of his plans. It would just be as simple as twisting a dagger a little deeper to force Anakin into his hands. It was so simple and so easy to do. Anakin, after having his vision rerouted thanks to Mace, would be optimistic upon seeing Padme. He did know that Obi-Wan had been there, but she was adamant that Obi-Wan was here to check on him. Anakin was appreciative. In the coming hours, Mace would request Anakin to inform the Chancellor about the current duel in Utapau between Obi-Wan and Grievous. When Anakin did tell the Chancellor, he learned the terrible truth. Palpatine was a Sith Lord. Due to the nature of Yoda and Mace being present on Coruscant, they would leave quickly, requesting that Skywalker stay behind. The Jedi would go in force, Sacy Tin, Coleman Cash, and Agon Kohler accompanying Yoda and Mace to the Executive Building. At the same time, Anakin would go to the Council Chambers so that he could wait until their return. He was obviously nervous about the whole thing, but he believed that he made the right choice. While he was waiting, he could hear Palpatine's voice call out to him. In its current clarity, he could tell that it was just Palpatine talking through his ear. These weren't memories. These were direct words coming from the elder politician at this moment. Anakin began to teeter, until one of the council members present on planet reached through the force to sedate these thoughts and plagues. Shocked, he was left behind so she could stop anything coming from Sidious, and that was it. Because she was alert to the issues going on, she quickly left her room for the council chambers to make sure Anakin stayed put. Inside the Chancellor's office, the Jedi attacked Sidious. He was quick to defend himself, blasting Egan, throwing Sacy into the wall. Yoda engaged as Sacy tried to engage, before Sacy and Coleman were cut down by the Sith Lord's precision. Yoda engaged after a short back and forth between him and Sidious. Their blades were flashing aggressive. Sidious used the force to launch Yoda into the wall, as Windu engaged Sidious, who pulled a quick one on him. Though Mace was proficient with the blade, he cut through the Chancellor's stomach, but he did not kill him. The Jedi may have been here to kill the Sith Lord, but as was the Jedi way, they could not kill an unarmed man. He would pay for his crimes against the galaxy. As quickly as they could, Mace and Yoda used force restraint, cufflinks, and slammed him down on Palpatine's wrist. It was too close for comfort. Sidious was truly the Dark Lord of the Sith too, having killed three of the five present Jedi Masters. But with the Sith Lord captured, the Jedi knew what they needed to do. They needed the Senate to remove him from power so they could deal with him themselves. The only issue is, aside from him being a Sith, which was an age-old Republic rule that most senators didn't know, is that he still had power. The Jedi were optimistic in their chances of securing Palpatine's removal from the role of Chancellor. While initially they came here to kill him, in hindsight it would have been harder to explain, so perhaps it was the best thing for them to do. It obviously wouldn't look good, but with three Jedi dead, it would be the proper way to conclude that Palpatine was a powerful wielder of the Force, just like the Jedi. The Jedi didn't know it yet, but Palpatine cut the cameras off in his office. Nothing aside from the audio was recorded, which Palpatine was going to cut after he won. Truthfully, even with Yoda present on Coruscant, Palpatine had no belief that he would lose. He thought he would have won the fight after having thrown Yoda through the wall, but Mace's use of a pod was much greater than even Sidious could have anticipated. In the coming hours, the Senate would be called upon to meet with the Jedi in the Senate chambers. There was a great tension about everything transpiring. Anakin was brought to the Senate building as Syndralic went to the Executive Building to have the bodies brought back to the Temple, but also so that all the audio and video recordings could be brought back to the Senate. Only the audio recordings would make it, being the Jedi didn't know the video ones had not been recorded. It was a lot of work to get done in a short amount of time. The Jedi also had the Temple Guards transport them from the Executive Building to the Senate Building just so the clones wouldn't have to be involved. However, to their surprise, the Senate Building was crawling with Coruscant Guardsmen. No matter, everything would be resolved. The Jedi used the Chancellor's pod to show off Palpatine as a great manipulator he was. The trial was one that started with outrage but continued to grow. Anakin watched from one of the bays as the talk got louder and longer. The Senators were outraged that the Jedi would make such a move, and Palpatine acted like he didn't know what was happening. But despite the lack of visual media, the auditorium media would prove what the Jedi were trying to say about the Sith Lord. So when the Senate prepared to remove Palpatine from power, he did what he could to make sure the Jedi failed, leaning over to the microphone for his final statement and speaking through the PA. The entire Senate building was radiating with the debate and the trial, though nothing was known outside the Senate building. 
This was all being done in secrecy to avoid the potential of the Republic looking weak, with Kenobi defeating Grievous and the war almost over. Palpatine cleared his throat and issued out to the clones Executive Order 91. No one knew what that meant until the clones that had been stationed in the Senate building by Palpatine came out to the Senate pods and started to open fire. Once the firefight started, chaos erupted. Sidious laughed, knowing the Jedi wouldn't kill him, but he was wrong. Mace dragged his lightsaber across Sidious' throat and leapt up from the Chancellor's pod to a Senate pod to stop the chaos. Yoda called out, telling the Senators to break away from their doors. The clones started going psycho. Anakin was next to Padme's pod, so he immediately ignited his weapon to stop the clone troopers. There was an issue with this. Because the Jedi were working against the clones, they were seen as agitators and targeted as well. It was a mess. Clones, Jedi, Senators, and so forth. In total pandemonium. The Temple Guards were a force end, though. Their presence helped quell the clones. Despite the order going out through the building, Commander Fox was the first of the clones to get sedated by the Temple Guards. And because all the other clones were unaware, they couldn't make an adjustment to request for reinforcements. Fox was very clear about the fact that the chain of command ran through him and no one else. And his choice to lead like that led to the clones not having reinforcements, though they outnumbered the Jedi. Yoda and Mace, on the other hand, worked unlike anything ever before. Windu didn't use his lightsaber and instead used his fists, while Yoda's ally was the Force. Windu crushed clone trooper armor with his fists, throwing the clones into each other without killing them, but definitely hurting them. The temple guards were untouchable. They didn't aim to kill, but they worked as a unit, cutting clone trooper weapons on the pieces and sedating them quickly. The senators were all in shock, many of them having been killed. Palpatine's initial reason for going with Order 91 is that he hoped all the people inside the Senate building would be killed, and then, because the Jedi would never kill an unarmed man, he would convince the public that the Jedi were behind the attack. He put a lot of faith into things out of his control, and it finally bit him in the back. He had the vision for it to work, but Mace had no intention of allowing that to come to fruition. After a chaotic battle, Anakin asked Padme if she was alright, which initially one would think that she was after having been defended by Anakin, but she was clipped in the lower back and didn't realize it due to the adrenaline. It was either a lucky or unlucky shot that came across the Senate chambers from another pot above her, when a clone was shooting at a senator and the blast clipped her instead. She was obviously fairly weak, and the pregnancy wasn't helping with that either. Anakin was able to get her medical assistance quickly as he rushed her out of the Senate building to the Republic Medical Building across the city. The Jedi Masters present didn't even notice, because they left so quickly. Mace and Yoda were doing damage control, which was a lot. Though the Senators were now much more inclined to trust the Jedi, and it was simply because of survival. They survived because of the Jedi. If they weren't present, then they all would be dead. Shock Teen Syndralic were brought over so they could try and deduce what happened to the clones, as Yoda sent Mace Windu to find Anakin. Windu was redirected towards the Republic Medical Building by Ryo Chuchi, who happened to see the two of them leaving that way. The other injured Senators were being escorted out of there. Anakin just got Padme out as soon as he could. Mace wasn't angry, he just wanted to make sure Skywalker was alright, as was his own motive but per the request of Master Yoda. When he arrived, he entered the medical wing and found Anakin and Padme in one of the medical rooms. They are holding hands, which Mace found a bit weird, but there was a lot of emotion going on. Due to the nature of blaster bolts, she had a lot of internal damage and she wasn't going to make it. There was a combination of reasons for this, though the main one being is that they took too long to get her here. She absorbed the injury early into the attack and it took nearly two hours for them to even notice the damage, plus the extra time to get her to the medical facility and so forth. It was a series of unfortunate events, but Padme was holding Anakin's hand and telling him not to blame himself. Luke and Leia, which were named by both parents, were his to take care of. She wouldn't have chosen this route and would never wish to abandon him, but sometimes fate has a weird way of putting them on paths. Padme wasn't exactly scared, but she was worried for Anakin. She asked that he promised to never lose himself, and he promised. Before she passed away, she told him that who he was, the most Anakin version of himself, was the best person she ever had. The person that, which she couldn't spend a lifetime with, enjoy the time of her life with. That's all she could say. She died seconds after Anakin promised her that he wouldn't lose himself. Mace didn't expect to see this when he came into the room. He was truthfully upset by this. Padme was a friend of his too. Certainly not as close as Anakin and Padme or Obi-Wan and Padme, but it was a sad loss of life. Also, Mace wasn't stupid. He knew there was something else going on here, but right now wasn't the time for that. The medical room was silent and he stepped in. Anakin looked up, but he didn't say anything before resting his head down by her side. She was gone, but he still couldn't process it. None of it felt real. Mace walked around and put his hand on Anakin's shoulder, telling him that she was now one with the Force. No matter where Anakin went, she would always be with him. 
Anakin looked up with tears in his eyes as Mace told Anakin that she'd be with him until he became one with the Force. In that moment, they would once again reunite. The moment was silent, but it was as tender as could be. Two individuals, maybe not the most trusting of each other, were present for the other in a moment of tragedy. It would stay that way for several minutes until Anakin was forced to say goodbye, and accept the reality of raising Luke and Leia on his own. However, he wouldn't be alone. He had his brothers and sisters inside the Jedi Order. Obviously, this would be a topic of discussion, and while Mace had his own feelings on the matter, he had no reason to start a discourse about it right now. That time would come later. For now, he'd be a guiding hand, a safe place and a gentle heart for Skywalker. As a Jedi, that was what he could specialize in, and he did all of that for him in the moment just for this moment. The coming weeks would continue with such travesties, being that many other senators who had been clipped or hit by clones would die from wounds during the small incursion. Those who survived became extremely aggressive towards the clones and called for a mass euthanization of the clone army. It was very close to passing, though some of the more reasonable members of the senate realized that their issue wasn't the clones, but the people who put the order into them, being the Kaminoans. The incident in the Senate building would get covered up while certain Senators died. No one knew why or what happened. The Jedi did such a good job of containment, the Senators did a proficient job at maintaining the status quo, and that was that. While the Separatist Council remained elusive, the Separatist government no longer cared for supporting the war effort after losses at Megiddo, Felucia, Kedanamodia, Kashyyyk, Coruscant, Boz Pity, Seleucami, Utapau, and Kaler. While Palpatine intentionally spread out the Jedi Council, him doing that resulted in the war coming to a close much faster than it would have otherwise. The Separatists were sunk, and they fell hard, especially under the might of a very aggravated Republic Senate. On the other hand, with Maul captured and brought into the Jedi Temple, the last of the Sith was as good as finished. The Jedi inversely decided that it would be best for the last Sith to become a Jedi, and end the legacy of the Sith on a positive note. So aside from the Council's worry of Maul being a Sith, they focused on restructuring him into a Jedi, which would be as hard as it sounded. Anakin, on the other hand, would receive the rank of Master for uncovering the plot revolving around Sidious, and remaining steadfast in the face of diversity. The Council did have to pat themselves on the back for this though. Who knows what would have happened if they didn't involve themselves. While the Council was at odds with the idea of Anakin having attachments, they believed that punishing him for it wouldn't do them any good. Yes, Anakin could be flaky when it came to Jedi responsibilities, and yes, he could be a little rough around the edges and difficult to trust, but at this point, the Jedi saw Anakin in a different light. He spent 13 years with someone talking in his ear, telling him the Jedi were the most evil people in the galaxy, and yet, through all that, despite his flaws, he was able to stay in the light. So because of that, why punish him? He brought balance to the Force by being directly involved in the process of pulling Sidious into the open. On the other hand, as Master Skywalker, He'd have the distinct pleasure of being involved in training his children, though this time they would be raised as Jedi. With the war closing, Ahsoka would rejoin as a knight and serve in the restitution process for the broken galaxy. Anakin's growth into Jedi Master on the High Council would serve as an inspiration to his children as they grow up into the ever-changing galaxy. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan Mandler, Sir William 1767, Darth Revan, Granddaddy Ben, Cullen Rooney, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Wewoo 670, Annika Stank Runner, CT7567, Azavaz, Darth Knox, Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Nguyen, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Kalik, Only Slayer 66, Mad Magic Dudus, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Fortress Lexi, Star Wars, Erebus, Rex the Wolf, The Man with Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button if you want to support me in other ways. Go check out the Patreon. Cool things on there as well as Sith Clone Wars every Saturday and animations. Otherwise, let's spot the story real quick. So I wanted to do like this idea where where where, where it has the Revenge of the Sith feel with a, a, a semi dark ending, but a, a positive like kind of like the M I guess like Empire Last Jedi kind of vibes where like it ends on a on a on a down try to note, but like the the future looks more promising than what we have experienced in that moment. The, the concept of Yoda kind of altering the, the mind of Anakin, like, feels anti-Jedi in a way, like, it goes against what the Jedi should be doing. But I think in a moment of panic, which is against the Jedi way, I thought it was interesting to explore how Yoda would respond to acting in such a way. So anyways, I hope you all enjoyed the video, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you.